Walt Whitman, pictured here as a young man in the 1840s, some years before he began his poetic output. Whitman is the first artist to look at the United States in a kind of spiritual fashion. He wrote in the preface to The Leaves of Grass, his, his major book, the United States themselves are essentially a great poem. Here at last is something in the doings of man that corresponds with the broadcast doings of the day and night. Here is not merely a nation, but a teeming nation of nations. And in his portrayal of the great poem of the United States, as a kind of mirror of the soul of the poet, Walt Whitman stands probably as America's greatest poet. Certainly he was a new voice in the 19th century. The other poet that would rival him, of course, was his contemporary, Emily Dickinson. She's in our anthology, but she is not someone we look at. We look at her in the follow-up course to this, English 3351. But together, Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson are are the great new voices in poetry of the 19th century, and no one has really done what Whitman did any better, and in terms of what he did, no one has even equaled him. So in, in my estimation, he, he certainly stands at the very center of the American um, poetic tradition. Welcome to English 3350, a survey of American literature before the Civil War. We're in Studio 3 at the MD Anderson Library on the main campus of the University of Houston. I'm Barry Wood. And today we're, we're embarking on the last of 29 classes in this course, looking at uh, Walt Whitman and trying to tie things together for this rather long course. Walt Whitman's great statement, of course, is his poem, Song of Myself, which is the lead, um, lead poem of Leaves of Grass, his major book, published in, in the first edition in 1855. This is the poem that starts Walt Whitman's career. Whitman is part of a generation that includes uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau. And although Whitman was not part of the transcendentalist group, not part of the club, after all he was, he was born and, and raised and worked in New York uh, State rather than Massachusetts, nevertheless he, he is in a sense transcendentalist in spirit. And in many ways he is a kind of fulfillment of um, Emerson's call for, for a poet of America. Song of myself, I celebrate myself, he wrote. His first line uh, is, is, a, is perhaps the most famous in all of his poetry. And Americans were somehow ready for someone to celebrate themselves in this fashion, perhaps because for 80 years, the, the idea of the importance of the individual self had been growing. And the sanctity of the private self had, uh, had been increasing ever since uh, the American government was founded on the notion of the, uh, the importance and the sanctity of the individual man. I celebrate myself, and what I assume, you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. And in that, uh, that third line we can sense uh, something about Whitman feeling that his identity extends beyond himself, somehow to encompass the rest of, of reality so that we all, in a sense, share. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease observing a spear of summer grass. Over the next third of a century, Whitman wrote hundreds of lines in which, in one way or another, he celebrated himself. 
the question is, what kind of self is this that he is celebrating? Apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am. Stands amused, complacent, compassionating, idle, unitary. Looks down, is erect, bends an arm on an impalpable certain rest. Looks with its side curved head, curious what will come next. Both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it. I have no mockings or arguments. I witness and wait. And it seems to me in those lines that the first and perhaps the, the, the second line from the end capture in some sense the kind of self that he is talking about. A self that is apart from the pulling and hauling. Both in and out of the game, watching and wondering at it. Whitman seems to celebrate a self that is above the world, somehow outside the world, and it, it, it seems to have a kind of immunity to the base materiality of, of the world. There's a strain of mysticism in, in Walt Whitman. This self is a kind of spiritual self above the concerns of the petty little ego. And some readers uh, familiar with Asian religions have, have seen the self that Whitman talks about as anal analogous to the, the self uh, with a capital S, or the spirit, I suppose, with a capital S in Hinduism, which uh, according to the formulas of Hinduism is, is equal to Brahman himself. The individual soul, in other words, is part or particle of Brahman himself. In, for instance, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which, which functions really as a kind of New Testament for Hinduism, um, we read lines that sound very, very much like Whitman. Here is uh, Krishna on the battlefield speaking to Arjuna and we need to understand that 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 Krishna is a kind of uh, incarnation of, of Brahman in a sense he is he is um, a, an incarnation in, in somewhat the same way as uh, Christ is in in Christian theology and his words sound very very much like the sort of thing that Whitman writes I am the starting point of the gods and of the great seers altogether. I am the origin of all. From me all comes forth. I am the soul, Gudakisa, that abides in the heart of all beings. I am the beginning and the middle of beings and the very end too of creations the beginning and the end, and the middle, too, am I. I am death that carries off all, and the origin of things that are to be. You may recall that when we looked at Emerson's poem, Brahma, that, uh, he, that, that we have the same sort of language in there. Uh, Oriental philosophy, and particularly Hinduism, came in in the 1840s in quite a wave of, of new translations uh, to New England. And we know that Emerson and Thoreau possessed a lot of these. We don't have absolute proof that Whitman did, but he seems to have picked up the same kind of, of uh, language. And um, the, 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 the main uh, point, of course, in that Brahma poem was the identity of both the creator Brahman and the destroyer uh, Shiva. They are two faces of one reality. And as you read the Bhagavad Gita here, uh, you, you can see that same sort of thing. Again, finishing up that quote, I am the gambling of rogues. This is not something the Christian God would say because we have in Christianity a separation between God and Satan. And, and no matter how mythological 
uh, you may regard those entities. Nevertheless, there is a separation of good and evil in Christianity, where good is attached to God and evil is either attached to the sinfulness of man or, or some sort of um, opposing entity. With the unity of, of good and bad as two faces of one reality, we have a different perception of things in Hinduism. I am the gambling of rogues. I am the majesty of the majestic. I am conquest. I am the spirit of adventure. I am the courage of the courageous. And those words, let me say again, are from the, the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, uh, which is a, a central chapter in a great Indian epic, which has come to stand at the very heart and soul of, of uh, Hinduism. It is the revelation of Krishna to, to man. And uh, the, the verses I've taken are from chapter 10, and you can see the verses printed there uh, at, at the bottom of the screen. Um, and so when you come back to Whitman and, and look at his lines, you can see the similarity. Again, those lines we've already looked at, apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am, both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it. Uh, this um, notion of, of self is um, something to contemplate uh, for a minute. Um, I think we're all aware that most of the time we feel ourselves more or less identifying with whatever task at hand um, we, uh, we have to do, whether it's going someplace or reading or studying or, or work, we, we more or less identify with what we're doing. But we all have those moments when uh, we've, we find our mind wandering and we find ourselves abstracted. And sometimes we find ourselves, in a sense, looking at ourselves in an objective way, uh, looking at ourselves and saying, you know, you've really got to improve, or you really need to do something different, or that was a stupid thing to do. And the, uh, the, that sort of perception has given rise over the centuries to a sense of a kind of double self. That is, there's the self that is fully engaged with what's going on in the world, and then there seems to be a second self which is capable of standing back and looking at the lower self and, and the physical body in a kind of objective way, almost as if um, the lower self and the body are, are someone else. That sense of, of upper and lower self runs through the transcendentalists with spirit or soul being considered the upper self that uh, is identified more or less with, with the divine spirit or with the Godhead, as, as I was at pains to emphasize with Emerson. Um, but we also find it in Whitman. Uh, Whitman, is when he's celebrating himself, is not just celebrating a, a, a selfish ego. He is celebrating a, a higher self that somehow extends beyond his being and is somehow a part of, of all other things. Uh, for instance, look at these, these lines. In all people, I see myself. I know I am solid and sound. To me, the converging objects of the universe perpetually flow. I know I am deathless. I know this orbit of mine cannot be swept by a carpenter's compass. Walt Whitman, a cosmos. The, the notion that I know I am deathless suggests a kind of eternal spirit uh, here, a, a soul that rises above the, the mere mortality of the body. And it's, it seems that, that that is definitely running through uh, uh, Whitman's language here. But it also, it, it, to me, the converging objects of the universe perpetually flow. Uh, we have this, this sense of, of things sort of coming in on the soul, converging on the soul, and it, this might remind you of the kind of thing that Emerson was, was talking about when 
uh, he, in his uh, essays, he had the, the soul confronted with nature, but by a kind of swallowing process, the soul would take in nature like a seed takes in the environment around it and grows itself into something bigger, which uh, in, in the Emersonian scheme was spirit. Soul grows upwards towards spirit by taking in uh, the things around it. And so when Whitman says, to me, the converging objects of the universe perpetually flow, I seem to get that same sense of, of the soul growing itself out of, uh, out of the world around. There's also a curious sense all through the, this uh, poem um, of a kind of identity with everyone else. Whitman I is one of the, the, the first um, people who shows an enormous empathy, one of the first artists to show an enormous empathy with, with everyone else. Um, during the Civil War, uh, he had a brother that was in, in uh, battle and uh, Whitman traveled down to Virginia and then volunteered in the hospitals in uh, Washington and for three or four hours every day he volunteered, he served in hospitals with the wounded in a sense, counseling them, assisting the doctors in, in uh, binding their wounds and so on. And it is estimated that during that three-year period, he personally talked to and served over 10,000 wounded soldiers. And wounded in, in the Civil War, you know, sometimes meant missing arms and legs. It wasn't, uh, I mean, the, the medical technology wasn't what it was today. And uh, this, this, in his real life suggests a kind of empathy with the common man. But we see it in this poem too. Look at what, look at his way of identifying. I am the hounded slave. I wince at the bite of the dogs. This is, this is 1855. This is uh, uh, still several years before the emancipation of the slaves. And, and it's, it's clear that Whitman is another one of these artists like Thoreau and Margaret Fuller and many others who is appalled by the whole idea of slavery. I am the mashed fireman with breastbone broken. Tumbling walls buried me in their debris. I am the old artillerist and tell of some fort's bombardment. I take part, I see and hear the whole. Now, if you try to take those words as, as being spoken by the limited ego or the limited man, Walt Whitman, it does not make logical sense because he wasn't an artillerist, he wasn't a slave, he wasn't a mashed fireman. The, the I am here at the beginning of those lines signifies a, a metaphor, a metaphorical identification of himself with these things. But the self that does that identification would, seems to be a higher self than the limited, um, uh, limited ego. But now just when you get to the point of being convinced that Walt Whitman is talking of a higher self, Something else pops up. I chant the chant of dilation or pride. We have had ducking and deprecating about enough. It's a very revealing word, that, pride. Talk of a higher self in Whitman sounds nice, but some readers are likely to feel that he has confused spirit with ego. There is, for instance, this well-known picture of Whitman, which appeared with the uh, first edition of Leaves of Grass. A jaunty young man with a, a tilted hat. Uh, if you're a Texan, of course, you maybe see him as a kind of New York cowboy. And uh, you know how cowboys in Texas uh, wear their hats indoors. It's, it's sort of considered proper and correct. And Whitman has a line, 
I wear my hat as I please, indoors or out. So, is this the higher spirit talking? What, what do we have here? This is the other Walt Whitman, a huge overblown ego. Walt Whitman, a cosmos of Manhattan the sun. If I worship one thing more than another, it shall be the spread of my own body. And of course, one beautiful line tells the whole story. I know perfect well my own egotism. So, which self is Walt Whitman advocating? Somehow, he managed to advocate both. In these lines, for instance, divine I am inside and out. That's the high self. That's the higher self, the godlike self speaking. Divine am I inside and out. That's, that's the spirit that transcends. But the second half of that line, and I make holy whatever I touch or am touched from, that's the big ego speaking. And so, in this poem, <clears throat> most readers, I think, sense that, that he slips back and forth between uh, both spirit and ego. And then, look how he goes on, having started out, in a sense, with spirit here, moved down to ego here, now look what he does. Uh, descending even further, the scent of these armpits is aroma finer than prayer. This head is more than churches or Bibles or creeds. Well, why did Americans respond to this poet, to this double message? Probably they responded to the higher self because that fit what Americans were coming to feel about themselves. In 1776, monarchy was thrown out, the private individual was exalted, the, the power of the individual was, was put in charge of, of government and lawmaking. Uh, the rights of man had become important with the Bill of Rights. There was something sacred in the little man. No longer was he the, the peasant behind the plow of medieval times or the, the factory worker uh, exploited by the, the powerful and the rich. The, the little man was now important and the, this, the, uh, the, uh, the idea of the self as being sacred and of value and having spiritual worth had come to the fore. And of course, Ralph Waldo Emerson had paved the way in, in his essay, Self-Reliance. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Speak your own thoughts and they shall be universal truths. To understand this curious mixture, then, of ego and spirit, I think, is to grasp Walt Whitman. And indeed, I think it is probably to grasp the meaning of what it is to be an American. Walt Whitman was born in Long Island in this house, a rural house on May 31st, 1919. He was born into a large family, the second of eight children who survived. Long Island had been settled by the Dutch originally, and then later when uh, it had been purchased, the English had moved in. For 200 years, both had, had uh, lived there, and his mother was uh, from a Dutch line, Laura van Velser. His father was English. Uh, the Whitmans had migrated to the New World in, in 1640, uh, coming originally, of course, into Massachusetts, but then migrating down to uh, Long Island. And there they had been uh, prosperous uh, farmers for at least two centuries. Long Island was given a special name uh, by Whitman 
in his own poetry, he called Long Island Palmonic. Um, actually, it's an Indian name, and he likened it to a kind of, of fish with the back here and, and the, the tail up here. Visualized it that way, and in more than one instance, he, he describes it that way in his poetry. As a boy, Whitman spent a great deal of time on farms, the Van Velser farm and also the, the uh, Whitman farm, coming to, to see many scenes like this of, of log houses and, and uh, rough-hewn uh, outbuildings. And of course, he also came to, to understand the work of the farm, the plowing, um, so he, um, he knew what it was like to, to work with his hands. He was, in a sense, very much a, a, uh, a farm worker himself. And, and uh, through his life, he conveyed that sort of image a great deal of the time. But as time went on, of course, Whitman eventually tramped almost every inch of, of uh, Long Island. He came to know its forests and its, and its valleys. He came to know its, its coastlines, uh, which inspired uh, several poems, including the great romantic poem about his own beginnings as a poet, uh, Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking. Not a poem we look at in this course, but certainly one that, that heads up what we do in English 3351, American Literature After the Civil War. And so he, he drew on his experience in, in Long Island for his knowledge of, uh, of nature and obviously identified with the Native Americans uh, in, in adopting their, uh, their name for the island. In the 1840s, Whitman was a print compositor, a school teacher, a journalist, an editor, and his writings and, and so on show up in at least 10 different newspapers in the 1840s in the uh, New York and Brooklyn area. And uh, let's just look at that uh, map again. And you'll see that where Brooklyn is, uh, uh, Manhattan is, is this island here, which, which has well over a million inhabitants and it, it triples in its population every day. Brooklyn is over here at the uh, end of, of Long Island. So this is where uh, he worked a good deal of the time. In 1848, he took a trip to New Orleans, and for three months he was the editor of the New Orleans Crescent. And uh, it is probable that while he was there, he had a, a, a passionate love affair. One poem has been cited again and again uh, for, f as evidence, uh, from pent-up aching rivers, full of suggestions and erotic language. The female form approaching, eye pensive, love flesh tremulous aching. The face, the limbs, the index from head to foot and what it arouses, the mystic deliria, the madness amorous, the utter abandonment. Hark, close and still what I now whisper. I love you, oh, you entirely possess me. The furious storm through me careering, I passionately trembling. And another poem seems to s say uh, something uh, very much the same. Once I passed through a populous city, and this would appear to be referring to New Orleans. Um, it's only seven lines long, but it has very explicit language which biographers are generally agreed upon. These are the first two lines. Once I passed through a populous city, imprinting my brain with its shows. Yet now, of all that city, I remember only a woman I casually met there who detained me for love of me. Back in Brooklyn, he continued his editorial work, cultivated friends, read widely, slowly gathered his poetic uh, strength, and 
uh, slowly evolved the, the central notion that uh, we find uh, standing at the very heart of his, his poetry, the notion of the, the soul. Now you'll recall that, that Emerson had developed the notion of the soul in terms of a, a, a growing organism some 20 years earlier. Uh, the soul, like a seed in the, in the physical realm, which takes in water and sunlight and, and soil and so on to grow a plant, so too the soul absorbs experience and grows itself um, upward. And the, uh, the living, growing tree is, is perhaps the best emblem of, of that. Of course, the, the growing tree, the, the organic plant, is central to, to all romantic theory, all the way back to British literature, too. Um, the, the soul, remember, is never merely a limited ego. Uh, a, a model um, like this just won't work. The notion that that somehow s the, the, the one soul, uh, the, the soul is separate from mind or separate from ego and again separate from body. The, the language of higher and lower, of course, can lead us into, into um, thinking this way. Uh, and, and the very structure of our language with its sort of noun uh, centered with, with nouns having a kind of border and boundary can lead us into thinking that, that soul and mind and other such terms are, are separate. Somehow we have to um, understand that, that this may be what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, that uh, there's a kind of intertwining of these faculties. We also have to be um, be careful that we don't see the soul as, as something inside in this fashion, uh, you know, something in here, trapped in the head, somewhere about where the pituitary gland is, like a bird trapped in a cage. Uh, that seems to be the, the, um, the image that has come down often in uh, Western culture when the body dies, then the soul escapes. Back in the 30s, there used to be experiments to try to weigh how much left when the soul left the body. Uh, again, that would be the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So either a model where the, the soul is separate from these or is trapped inside um, doesn't work. Something like this might work where here we have the mind and the body, and somehow the circle represents the soul. In other words, mind and body are somehow encompassed in, in soul. And um, now, that, what does that mean? Uh, I think we need, to, we need to think in terms perhaps of uh, field theory here. If, if you think about, uh, let's say downtown, we've got radio stations, television stations that beam out, and those, um, those pulses that are beamed out from a central place permeate the whole atmosphere, and we are inside the field of, for, for most of those television stations. If we, if we had a television or a radio here, we could turn it on, and that would prove that, that we are inside the field. Uh, that, is, that is created by these beams uh, um, coming out. We're also, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, we, our own consciousness is a kind of, of uh, field. If you think about your own experience, you recognize that at any particular moment, uh, the world consists in, in, a, in a private sort of way of a, of a circle around, around you. The limits of that are the limits of what you can see and hear at any particular time. Um, in this studio, for instance, it's, it's limited by, 
the uh, the walls if you're watching this on television it's it's perhaps limited by the room that you're in when you're watching and we all know that one of the, the, the reasons to go out into the world out outside particularly to a natural setting is the sort of expansion of horizon and we all know that we 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 feel a kind of ex spiritual expansion of some kind when we get into that kind of a, a setting well this could be understood in terms of field theory. The field of our own consciousness, the field of our awareness, is um, somehow expanded in if we're in a, a wide open sort of environment. But that's to talk about it spatially. There's also something going on uh, temporally too. When we, let's say, sit down and read a story placed in the last century, or we read an, uh, an epic by Homer that's placed, uh, uh, that takes, takes place in the 12th or 13th century BC, or when we perhaps stretch our imaginations back into pr primitive or prehistoric times through studying evolution or anthropology or geology, and our mind expands back into uh, millions of years, or perhaps we, we look at, through a telescope, at the galaxies and we, we learn that the light is, is hundreds of millions or even billions of years old. We are also expanding a field of awareness, but in this case it's through time. And um, this, I think, is what Emerson was getting at when he, he wanted to promote the, uh, the, the, the study of, the, of history by the scholar. It's a way of expanding awareness both spatially and, and temporally. So the, this, this um, circular soul, and to come back to this diagram, is, is only a beginning way. This circle represents the kind of field of awareness of of the perceiving self at the center. Another way of, of looking at it is in this fashion, the, the, uh, the, the self, body and mind at the center is a, a kind of focal point for a, a converging uh, number of lines of force from the entire environment. And this, of course, is a spatial picture. We'd have to understand this too, as, as I've suggested in temporal terms, as we become knowledgeable about the past, uh, about the distant galaxies, about the history of the Earth, about other peoples and so on, um, our, uh, this field of awareness, in other words, is not particularly space or time bound. Uh, in, in, a, in a sense, if I, if I uh, look uh, at the camera, for instance, that's my field of awareness at this moment. But if I say the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a, a, a sort of twin to the galaxy we're in, it's about uh, two million light years away, suddenly my field of awareness has expanded out two million light years. And so um, this, this is central, I think, to Emerson and, and Thoreau and certain, certainly Whitman, that there needs to be a kind of expansion process. And all of them in one way or another through essays or through Thoreau's explorations at Walden Pond, uh, through, what Thoreau is, or through what Whitman is doing in his poetry, all are trying to promote that kind of expansion of, of consciousness. And so while we can look at uh, this, this self and soul as a point of convergence of forces like this which grows, there is also a sense in which the arrows go the other way, in which consciousness is projected outwards so that what we receive are, are multiple variations, waves for instance of, of light and the mind comes to these and, and reinterprets long ones and short ones and all those in between and colors them and greens up the world and, and blues it and browns it and so on. Colors, after all, are the, 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 the way um, different length vibrations are seen in the mind. Um, so if we understand then uh, the soul as somehow a combination of this activity of, of a convergence of the world upon the self as a field of convergence and also as a field of projection from the self outwards, 
And it, in both cases, you see that the self or the soul is not something confined within the mind, nor is it something separate from them. It is, is a kind of encompassing, um, encompassing field. We can then, I think, come to understand some of Whitman's language when he says the American poets are to enclose old and new, for America is the race of races. Old and new, of course, by that he's talking about the history of Europe and also the history of the New World. And because the, the poet, of course, is the sort of archetypal expansive soul. The poet is the man who expands as much as he can to encompass not only the whole of nature, the whole of history, but all the rest of the people. Uh, of them, he says, a bard is to be commensurate with the people. To him, the other continents arrive as contributions. And if you can visualize that diagram of converging forces coming in on the self, you can see the kind of thing he's saying. Uh, this is what, what is meant, incidentally, by the, the sort of uh, uh, almost sp spiritual power of soul in, among the transcendentalists when they um, seem to, to say that the material world is less important and that the mind can actually manipulate the physical world, they don't mean that, that it can levitate things or make things go out of existence. What they mean is, is that the, the physical body, nature and so on, becomes simply food and fodder for the growth of the soul. In that sense, the soul is ultimately the goal here. Uh, material objects don't have meaning apart from the self and the soul for the transcendentalist. And so the, the American poet, uh, to come back to that quotation, the, his spirit responds to his country's spirit. He incarnates its geography and natural life and rivers and lakes. And uh, Whitman conveys this sense in some very interesting language. Um, it's, it's almost as if he visualized a kind of expansion of his own body. In the preface to Leaves of Grass, the 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass, um, he wrote, when the long Atlantic coast stretches longer and the Pacific coast stretches longer, he, that is the poet, uh, uh, easily stretches with them north and south. He spans between them also from east to west and reflects what is between them. Often in, in, um, in Song of Myself we get this kind of picture of Whitman sort of spread-eagled across the American continent with you know, one foot in, in Washington State and one arm in Baja, California and his head somewhere over Florida and uh, the, the, his body sort of being the mountains and hills of the landscape, uh, growing up with trees and so on. Um, a kind of cosmic man imagery spanning and, and sprawling across the continent. And uh, to convey that sort of thing, Whitman almost, often uses uh, catalogs. Uh, for instance, he, he goes on from this quotation. Uh, he spans between them also from east to west and reflects what is between them. Suddenly we get this picture of, of Whitman spread across the continent and the whole, the whole forest growing out of him. On him, rise solid growths that offset, and now notice the catalog, offset the growth of pine and cedar and hemlock and live oak and locust and chestnut and cypress and hickory and lime tree and cottonwood and tulip tree and cactus and wild vine and tamarind and persimmon, and tangles as tangled as any canebrake or swamp, and forests coated with transparent ice and 
icicles hanging from boughs. That's just one of many catalogs that we run across in this poem. This one is a catalog of all the species of trees, but there are big sections in this poem where he will talk about people, and he'll talk about uh, foresters and lumbermen and farmers. He'll talk about fishermen and traders and sea captains. He'll talk about people in every walk of life, all the way down to, to the beggars and the poor people and the homeless people and the prostitutes and the wounded and the soldiers and, and so forth. And the effect of these catalogs in, in his poems is, is very much if you're, if you're familiar at all with epics, such as Homer's Iliad, or his Odyssey, or Virgil's Aeneid, or Milton's Paradise Lost, of course Dante's uh, um, Divine Comedy, you will perhaps recognize the, the, that one of the standard tools of, of epic presentation is the catalog. In, in Homer's Iliad, uh, when they're gathering ships and so on to, uh, to do battle against Troy, there's a whole catalog of all the nations that have come together under Agamemnon to, to make the expedition to Troy. And we get a kind of catalog of all the ships that, that are ready to sail. And such catalogs um, going on and on in this fashion give a kind of epic scope to the story. And um, Incidentally, Whitman is not the, the only one to do this in his poetry. A, a similar thing is, is going on in a work that we're not looking at at this course because it's, it's just a monster work too big for a, for a survey course, but that is uh, Herman Melville's Moby Dick. And if, uh, if you're familiar with that work, you, you know that one of the great frustrations in reading it is what everybody calls the whaling chapters. Well, the whaling chapters consist of, a, in a sense, a, a kind of huge epic catalog of all the things that go into the whaling community, species of whales and the, the kinds of jobs that need to be done, the kinds of, of tasks that need to be done, the kind of men that are suitable to the kinds of tasks. And the whaling chapters tend to expand the story infinitely. Well. Whitman is, is certainly uh, doing that in, uh, in Song of Myself. And thus, as the self expands at the center of Song of Myself, taking in more and more, what it's taking in is the larger and larger American landscape. At the physical level, it's the trees, the rivers, the fields, the forests, the mountains. At the human level, it's the cities, the ships, the docks, the companies, the homes, the farms, and of course all the different kinds of people, all the different races, all the different ethnic groups, all the different occupations. And all of this stuff is sort of dragged in bodily uh, into, the, into the poem, confusing often because you wonder what, it, what he's talking about. What he's talking about is the soul, the expansive soul. And all of these things are there because they are the contents of consciousness. As Whitman's soul expands out to include everything, all of these things become pieces within his soul and his self. And since this is a song of himself, it is also paradoxically a song for all of America. Well, I think it's time to, to try to draw some of this together. By now you'll recognize this. It's, it's our central outline for American romanticism that we've been looking at ever since we, we dipped into Cooper and, and Irving uh, way back about the middle of this course. Romanticism can be treated uh, in terms of its subject matter, in terms of its techniques, and in terms of its philosophy. Now, we're going to look at the first two of these points, the subject matter of Romanticism and the techniques of Romanticism. Let's look at the subject matter of Romanticism first and look at the general headings under that 
that topic, the subject matter of romanticism. These are things that we have uh, looked at before. Uh, the emphasis on the past, the treatment of nature and the American frontier, the use of idealized heroes, heroes and heroines, portrayal of madness and or obsession, and inward explorations. Now, in thinking about um, Thoreau and Whitman, because we really haven't had this outline on the, on the uh, screen since way back when we were looking at uh, Hawthorne, <coughs> in thinking about uh, now Thoreau and <coughs> Whitman, um, our focus is going to be on part B, nature and the American frontier, and, uh, and then on uh, uh, madness and obsession and finally inward exploration. So let's look at the first of these first, nature and the American frontier. And again, we have some familiar material here uh, because this is an add-on list. We've already uh, pointed to Cooper's Forest Frontiers in Last of the Mohicans and the Western Frontier in the Prairie and the Wild Pigeon scene, which we read specifically in the Pioneers. But now as we move to Thoreau, we, we find uh, a great deal more of, of nature being portrayed. In fact, um, Thoreau is, is almost exclusively, except for his political pieces like Resistance to Civil Government and Slavery in Massachusetts, he's almost exclusively an explorer of nature. We have rivers, the seashore. Rivers come up in a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. The seashore certainly comes up extensively in Cape Cod. Forests and, and rivers, uh, and of course the pond comes up in Walden. There are numerous climbs that he does in, on mountains uh, in, in both the first week where listed a week on the Concord where he climbs Mount Washington and then in the Maine woods where he climbs Mount Katahdin. We, we see that Thoreau is, is almost exclusively a, an explorer of nature and this is certainly an important part then of his romanticism. But when we move on now to Whitman, uh, I've tried to summarize it here in talking about Whitman's inclusive geography, his huge catalogs of the landscape. And, and if you read um, Song of Myself carefully, you'll, you'll find places where if you've traveled in this country, you, you almost sense that you're moving. There's one section, for instance, where uh, one feels that one is moving along Route 80 from Chicago to San Francisco. You can, you can sort of feel as the geography unfolds across the prairies and into the, the Wyoming and the Wasatch Mountains and so on. Uh, you, can, you can feel the movement along that particular route. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there, there are um, other places where if you're familiar with other parts of the country, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd sense that too. Uh, now, still dealing with the subject matter of Romanticism and um, moving on to point D under that, uh, we've treated this before too, uh, madness or ob obsession, and certainly Poe and Hawthorne uh, are the major contributors to uh, this component of Romanticism in American literature. Uh, Poe with his, his narrators in Ligeia, The Telltale Heart, Hawthorne's Mad Scientist in Rappuccini's Daughter, and Aylmer in The Birthmark, and Father Hooper in The Minister's Black Veil. Um, I certainly think that we need to add, however, Chillingworth in The Scarlet Letter. He is certainly one of the most obsessed of all Hawthorne's characters. And since we have mentioned um, Moby Dick, Melville's Moby Dick, uh, Captain Ahab uh, certainly is, is a man possessed. 
obsessed with, with catching the great white whale. He's had one leg chewed off and he's determined to wreak vengeance and uh, probably uh, Moby Dick is the most sustained treatment in this period of, of a total um, obsession. And since obsession, you see, is, is a kind of tapping into the dark forces, one, one has the feeling that, uh, that um, Captain Ahab is tapping into to, to a kind of satanic, um, demonic level of evil. Uh, you can see how this fits into um, romanticism bec because you've seen this over and over again. Um, the mad scientists in Hawthorne, the, uh, the guilty narrators in Poe, all seem to be sort of Faustian characters tapping into some great reservoir of, of, uh, of evil. And this is an integral part of, of American Romanticism. And uh, then, of course, looking at uh, E under the subject matter of Romanticism, we come to inward explorations. Again, uh, the prime examples that we've had up to this point would be Poe's narrators in the manuscript found in a bottle and followed the House of Usher. But Thoreau and Whitman add important dimensions to uh, these inward explorations. All of Thoreau's works, whether it's a week on the Concord and Merrimack, Walden, Cape Cod, or the Maine woods, all of these uh, works really are about the exploration of self. And in fact, if you read, if you read Whitman and Song of Myself and, and grasp this notion of soul expanding to, to take in a world, you can really go back and read Thoreau with better understanding. You begin to understand what he's up to out there on the pond, floating around in a boat in the dark of the night, looking up at the stars, looking down into the water, and suddenly having these strange illusions that he doesn't know whether he's looking down or looking up because the stars are reflected in the water. He is surrounded by stars, which in fact we are. I mean, we, we only see them when we look up. But all the ones that are below us, of course, are hidden by the earth. But we're surrounded by stars. And, and uh, Thoreau's uh, explorations this way, his measuring the depth of the pond is somehow a measuring of the depths of himself. The, the um, noting that the, the level of water rises in all the ponds all around Concord at roughly the same level uh, makes him think that there's a kind of spiritual constant under nature which rises and falls in some sort of rhythmic way. And as you read these uh, sorts of details in Thoreau, with an understanding from Whitman, you can begin to see that he's, he's trying to explore the same sort of encompassing self. These things are not simply important as alien objects, ponds, trees, mountains out there for us to look at in some cold, clinical, impersonal way, you know, measuring and weighing and evaluating. These are important because they are contents of consciousness. They are within the soul. And in studying what is in the soul, one is indirectly studying what is, what is oneself. And so uh, we find then that what Whitman is doing, and, and uh, we, as I say, we can look at Thoreau as doing the same way. Whitman is detailing the contents of the soul in Song of Myself. And if it seems that he is detailing all of America, well, that's right, because for, for Whitman, the, uh, the soul must somehow be commensurate with all of the people. It must somehow be identified with, with all of the people. Whitman has a true sense of a, what a representative poet would be. He's, he's not just someone that you elect. He is uh, sort of a symbol that you put up there in f front of, of everybody, sort of like a, uh, an elected official, a politician. He somehow embodies the entire spirit um, 
of the people. Well, if we move then from the subject matter of Romanticism to techniques of Romanticism, we can, uh, we've already treated epic presentation in connection with Cooper's landscape descriptions. And uh, now we can, we can add considerably to this. Um, I've already commented on Melville's whaling chapters in, in Moby Dick. Uh, these, these certainly give that work an, an epic kind of scope. Whitman's description of America's places and people in Song of Myself fits into the same kind of, of epic presentation. And again, the, the epic catalogs uh, uh, certainly uh, do the same sort of thing. Whitman himself seemed to have a, a kind of grandfather of America look about him. This is a, this is a picture on further on into the, into the uh, 1870s, but with that a long flowing white beard and, and always the sort of uh, statuesque quality about him. Um, he, he came to stand for people as a kind of uh, uh, symbol for American man. Now Whitman really only wrote one book over and over again and that's Leaves of Grass which was published in the first edition in 1855. Then in a second edition in 1856, and a third in 1865. Now what he did then was, was he, uh, he added sections, the drum taps uh, section, uh, a group of poems in, in 1865 uh, and a sequel to it in 1866 were very quickly then incorporated into a fourth edition in 1867 of, of Leaves of of grass. The, the uh, book, in other words, which keeps growing uh, through his lifetime is, is a single book that, that almost like the soul itself keeps growing by a kind of accretion. Democratic Vistas uh, in 1870 and 71, uh, um, which is a kind of long poetic prose uh, uh, thing, um, then becomes the occasion for almost an immediate revision of Leaves of Grass, a fifth edition. And if you follow this through, uh, in 1876, Leaves of Grass, a sixth edition, in 1881 and two, a seventh edition, and an eighth edition in 1882, and then another section called Specimen Days was added, and finally, in the last year of his life, in 1892, the ninth edition, the last edition of Leaves of Grass was published, and this is often referred to as the, uh, the deathbed edition. <clears throat> of all mankind, the great poet is the equable man. As he sees the farthest, he has the most faith. His thoughts are the hymns of the praise of things. In the talk on the soul and the eternity and God of his equal plane, he is silent. He sees eternity in men and women. He does not see men and women as dreams or dots. This is a passage that, that uh, suggests the kind of mystical uh, streak in, in, Emerson, or in, uh, in Whitman. I have heard that the talkers were talking the talk of the beginning and the end, but I do not talk of the beginning or the end. There was never any more inception than there is now. Inception here means creation. Nor any more youth and age than there is now, and will never be any more perfection than there is now, nor any more heaven or hell than there is now. Certainly one can sense that mystical strain that, that in, in Thoreau came out when he said, I have been anxious to live in the nick of time, the joining point between two eternities, the past and the present. <clears throat> 
and Whitman certainly with those four last lines, each ending in now, is, is working with the same, uh, uh, the same sort of thing. Well, at his roots, Whitman comes from rural America, and Long Island certainly was rural in those days. He comes out of the, the great farming tradition, the, the big barns stacked with hay, and you, you sense over and over again that rural tradition coming out in his, his poetry, a sense that he has He's been in places like this, in the big barns, that he's walked the beams, that he's looked at the sunlight coming through the, the, the cracks of the boards. Um, and always that seems to be the, the sort of world that, that he is um, working against. But he expands into something much more, a, a really grand old fatherly figure as portrayed in this, perhaps the last poet, uh, portrait of his life. Well, we've, we're coming now to the end of this long course. We began when this was America, just an endless wasteland of, of trees, forest. We began 30,000 years ago with the migrations of the Native Americans across Beringia when ice covered the continent. And we moved into the great era of building, where monumental ruins like, like this one, the Anastasi ruins, were constructed out in the, in the desert. We've looked at some of the great art that was produced by civilizations like the Incas and the Aztecs. <coughs> and then we've moved on to the immigrants from Europe, starting with Christopher Columbus, and how men like Columbus and, uh, met the Native Americans on a friendly basis. Men like John Smith, Captain John Smith in Virginia and later in New England. But we've also seen how the whole scene could easily turned sour. It was the Spanish, after all, that destroyed Aztec civilization. It was New Englanders that progressively moved west and took the land. And of course, it was Native Americans who retaliated. It was progressively more vicious. And a combination of, of Ex understandable viciousness on the part of the Native Americans, and then, of course, the Puritan idea of, of the Indians as being incarnations of the devil, sometimes led to, to scenes like this. This is European pictures of Native Americans roasting people. Here you see them with pieces of arms and legs over fires roasting. This is a projection, a European projection on the Native Am Americans. And it, what it fails to, to, uh, n to note is that, that that kind of violence, where it did occur, uh, was, was often the product of, of um, pressure from Europeans who, who uh, if, if the Native Americans turn vicious, it's, there's a good reason for it. Of course, the Native Americans have given us great myths mythology, Pocahontas, and we have myth-making uh, in operation with Pocahontas. We don't really know if this incident of Pocahontas and Captain John Smith ever occurred or if it's a literary borrowing or a sheer fabrication, but it has become one of the great myths and legends of American times. Well, from the 17th century, we've moved into then the 18th century and the Enlightenment. Benjamin Franklin one of the most interesting of man, often thought of as, as a non-fiction writer, a biography writer, a, an inventor. But we've looked at all of the different roles that he plays, all the different personas that he's taken, taken up, pretending to be poor Richard Saunders, per, uh, putting words in the mouth of Father Abraham, uh, 
putting words in the mouth of a fictitious Polly Baker, um, and often enough that one senses that in disguise, Franklin has, is a man of great imagination. He is a, a, a literary writer, a story writer, just waiting to break loose. But in the 18th century, this was not particular, particularly popular, and so Franklin remains a, a printer by trade most of his life and moves in, in public life. The 18th century Americans were a particularly brilliant lot. Here is that amazing house designed by uh, Jefferson at Monticello. Um, and so we've, that's the second great period of American literature in this period. The colonial Puritan is the first, the Enlightenment is the second. And then finally we move into, into the 19th century with the, the great romantics, people like Hawthorne, who, who certainly has one of the most extended uh, bodies of, of tales and um, romances with, with four big romances. Of course, uh, Cooper's important too, but, but Hawthorne uh, overtakes Cooper in, in sheer uh, reputation. And of course, the dark side of, of American Romanticism, Edgar Allan Poe, a twisted sort of man um, adopted in this, grew up in the South uh, and, and wrote some of the most macabre of all American tales, portraying in a sense the sort of dark side of, of American life. And then we have the experimenters, certainly of course um, uh, Thoreau with his experiment at Walden Pond stands uppermost in terms of lifestyle experiments. Uh, part of all the utopian communities, but Thoreau is a very much an individualist with his life at Walden Pond. And of course his cabin is, is there marked in that fashion with posts and, and chains at Walden Pond, as I mentioned at the northwest uh, corner, a place that's still a very peaceful one to visit, uh, certainly worth seeing. And of course, the forests around Concord too have a kind of majesty, and all the more so if you've read these writers, if you if you read Emerson and Thoreau, and then tramp through these woods. We've also seen that this is a, a very traumatic period, with African Americans like Frederick Douglass going through terrible agonies, or a woman like Harriet Jacobs. Um, seven years hidden in an attic waiting until she can escape with her children. And then this remarkable woman who penned the, the central novel of the whole abolitionist movement, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the major bestseller of the whole, overtook um, Charlotte Temple, the major bestseller of the last half of the 19th century. Meanwhile, the Native Americans are coming to their end, and of course there are no more uh, important words about that coming to an end than those of Chief Seattle that we've already looked at in a previous class. Our people are disappearing like a rapidly receding tide. At the center of American literature, though, there seems always to be the landscape. The, uh, nature. It, it, it runs there as something alien among the Puritans, as something to be designed and conquered by the men of the Enlightenment, as something to be penetrated by the Romantics, a, a kind of mysterious nature permeated by, by spirit and self and soul. Well, have a good day.